Hi, friends. I'm Annie F. Downs. Let's read the Gospels. The Gospels are the first four books of the New Testament in the Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. These are the stories of Jesus Christ's life on earth, the friendships, the parables, the sacrifices, the meals, the miracles. Each month we read all four books. So go ahead, subscribe. Don't miss any of the days as we are starting in the book of Matthew and working our way all the way through all four books. Here's how this is going to work. I'll read three chapters to you today. You can listen or read along in your own Bible, and then I'll pray, and that's it. So today is August 6th, day 6, and I'll be reading Matthew chapters 16 through 18, and this month I'm reading from the message. Matthew 16. Some Pharisees and Sadducees badgered him again, pressing him to prove himself to them. He told them, you have a saying that goes, red sky at night, sailors delight. Red sky at morning, sailors take warning. You find it easy enough to forecast the weather. Why can't you read the signs of the times? An evil and wanton generation is always wanting signs and wonders. The only sign you'll get is the Jonah sign. Then he spun around and walked away. On their way to the other side of the lake, the disciples discovered they had forgotten to bring along bread. In the meantime, Jesus said to them, keep a sharp eye out for Pharisee, Sadducee yeast. Thinking he was scolding them for forgetting bread, they discussed in whispers what to do. Jesus knew what they were doing and said, why all these worried whispers about forgetting the bread? Baby believers, haven't you caught on yet? Don't you remember the five loaves of bread and the 5,000 people and how many baskets of fragments you picked up? Or the seven loaves that fed 4,000 and how many baskets of leftovers you collected? Haven't you realized yet that bread isn't the problem? The problem is yeast, Pharisee, Sadducee, yeast. Then they got it, that he wasn't concerned about eating, but teaching, the Pharisee, Sadducee kind of teaching. When Jesus arrived in the villages of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, what are people saying about who the Son of Man is? They replied, some think he is John the baptizer. Some say Elijah, some Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. He pressed them, and how about you? Who do you say I am? Simon Peter said, you're the Christ, the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus came back. God bless you, Simon, son of Jonah. You didn't get that answer out of books or from teachers. My father in heaven, God himself, let you in on this secret of who I really am. And now I'm going to tell you who you are, really are. You are Peter, a rock. This is the rock on which I will put together my church, a church so expansive with energy that not even the gates of hell will be able to keep it out. And that's not all. You will have complete and free access to God's kingdom, keys to open any and every door. No more barriers between heaven and earth, earth and heaven. A yes on earth is yes in heaven. A no on earth is no in heaven. He swore the disciples to secrecy. He made them promise they would tell no one that he was the Messiah. Then Jesus made it clear to his disciples that it was now necessary for him to go to Jerusalem, submit to an ordeal of suffering at the hands of the religious leaders, be killed, and then on the third day be raised up alive. Peter took him in hand, protesting, impossible, master, that can never be. But Jesus didn't swerve. Peter, get out of my way. Satan, get lost. You have no idea how God works. Then Jesus went to work on his disciples. Anyone who intends to come with me has to let me lead. You're not in the driver's seat. I am. Don't run from suffering. Embrace it. Follow me and I'll show you how. Self-help is no help at all. Self-sacrifice is the way, my way, to finding yourself, your true self. What kind of deal is it to get everything you want but lose yourself? What could you ever trade your soul for? Don't be in such a hurry to go into business for yourself. Before you know it, the Son of Man will arrive with all the splendor of his Father, accompanied by an army of angels. You'll get everything you have coming to you, a personal gift. This isn't pie in the sky by and by. Some of you standing here are going to see it take place. See the Son of Man in kingdom glory. Matthew 17. Six days later, three of them saw that glory. Jesus took Peter and the brothers, James and John, and led them up a high mountain. His appearance changed from the inside out right before their eyes. Sunlight poured from his face. His clothes were filled with light. Then they realized that Moses and Elijah were also there in deep conversation with him. Peter broke in. Master, this is a great moment. What would you think if I built three memorials here on the mountain, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah? 
While he was going on like this, babbling, a light, radiant cloud enveloped them and sounding from deep within the cloud, a voice, this is my son, marked by my love, focus of my delight, listen to him. When the disciples heard it, they fell flat on their faces, scared to death. But Jesus came over and touched them. Don't be afraid. When they opened their eyes and looked around, all they saw was Jesus, only Jesus. Coming down the mountain, Jesus swore them to secrecy. Don't breathe a word of what you've seen. After the Son of Man is raised from the dead, you are free to talk. The disciples, meanwhile, were asking questions. Why do the religion scholars say that Elijah has to come first? Jesus answered, Elijah does come and get everything ready. I'm telling you, Elijah has already come, but they didn't know him when they saw him. They treated him like dirt, the same way they are about to treat the Son of Man. That's when the disciples realized that all along he had been talking about John the baptizer. At the bottom of the mountain, they were met by a crowd of waiting people. As they approached, a man came out of the crowd and fell to his knees, begging, Master, have mercy on my son. He goes out of his mind and suffers terribly, falling into seizures. Frequently, he is pitched into the fire, other times into the river. I brought him to your disciples, but they could do nothing for him. Jesus said, what a generation, no sense of God, no focus to your lives. How many times do I have to go over these things? How much longer do I have to put up with this? Bring the boy here. He ordered the afflicting demon out, and it was out, gone. From that moment on, the boy was well. When the disciples had Jesus off to themselves, they asked, why couldn't we throw it out? Because you're not yet taking God seriously, said Jesus. The simple truth is that if you had a mere kernel of faith, a poppy seed, say, you would tell this mountain move and it would move. There is nothing you wouldn't be able to tackle. As they were regrouping in Galilee, Jesus told them, The Son of Man is about to be betrayed to some people who want nothing to do with God. They will murder him, and three days later he will be raised alive. The disciples felt scared to death. When they arrived at Capernaum, the tax men came to Peter and asked, Does your teacher pay taxes? Peter said, Of course. But as soon as they were in the house, Jesus confronted him. Simon, what do you think? When a king levies taxes, who pays, his children or his subjects? He answered his subjects. Jesus said, Then the children get off free, right? But so we don't upset them needlessly. Go down to the lake, cast a hook, and pull in the first fish that bites. Open its mouth and you'll find a coin. Take it and give it to the tax men. It will be enough for both of us. Matthew 18. At about the same time, the disciples came to Jesus asking, Who gets the highest rank in God's kingdom? For an answer, Jesus called over a child whom he stood in the middle of the room and said, I'm telling you once and for all that unless you return to square one and start over like children, you're not even going to get a look at the kingdom, let alone get in. Whoever becomes simple and elemental again, like this child, will rank high in God's kingdom. What's more, when you receive the childlike on my account, it's the same as receiving me. But if you give them a hard time bullying or taking advantage of their simple trust, you'll soon wish you hadn't. You'd be better off dropped in the middle of the lake with a millstone around your neck, doomed to the world for giving these God-believing children a hard time. Hard times are inevitable, but you don't have to make it worse. And it's doomsday to you if you do. If your hand or your foot gets in the way of God, chop it off and throw it away. You're better off maimed or lame and alive than the proud owners of two hands and two feet, godless in a furnace of eternal fire. And if your eye distracts you from God, pull it out and throw it away. You're better off one-eyed and alive than exercising your 2020 vision from inside the fire of hell. Watch that you don't treat a single one of these childlike believers arrogantly. You realize, don't you, that their personal angels are constantly in touch with my Father in heaven. Look at it this way. If someone has a hundred sheep and one of them wanders off, doesn't he leave the 99 and go after the one? And if he finds it, doesn't he make far more over it than over the 99 who stay put? Your Father in heaven feels the same way. He doesn't want to lose even one of these simple believers. If a fellow believer hurts you, go and tell him. Work it out between the two of you. If he listens, you've made a friend. If he won't listen, take one or two others along so that the presence of witnesses will keep things honest. And try again. If he still won't listen, tell the church. If he won't listen to the church, you'll have to start over from scratch, confront him with the need for repentance, and offer again God's forgiving love. 
Take this most seriously. A yes on earth is yes in heaven. A no on earth is no in heaven. What you say to one another is eternal. I mean this. When two of you get together on anything at all on earth and make a prayer of it, my Father in heaven goes into action. And when two or three of you are together because of me, you can be sure that I'll be there. At that point, Peter got up the nerve to ask, Master, how many times do I forgive a brother or sister who hurts me? Seven? Jesus replied, seven, hardly. Try 70 times seven. The kingdom of God is like a king who decided to square accounts with his servants. As he got underway, one servant was brought before him who had run up a debt of $100,000. He couldn't pay up, so the king ordered the man, along with his wife, children, and goods to be auctioned off at slave market. The poor wretch threw himself at the king's feet and begged, Give me a chance and I'll pay it all back. Touched by his plea, the king let him off, erasing the debt. The servant was no sooner out of the room when he came upon one of his fellow servants who owed him ten dollars. He seized him by the throat and demanded, Pay up now. The poor wretch threw himself down and begged, Give me a chance and I'll pay it all back. But he wouldn't do it. He had him arrested and put in jail until the debt was paid. When the other servants saw this going on, they were outraged and brought a detailed report to the king. The king summoned the man and said, You evil servant, I forgave your entire debt when you begged me for mercy. Shouldn't you be compelled to be merciful to your fellow servant who asked for mercy? The king was furious and put the screws to the man until he paid back his entire debt. And that's exactly what my Father in heaven is going to do to each one of you who doesn't forgive unconditionally anyone who asks for mercy. That is Matthew 16 through 18 in the message. Let's pray. Oh, Jesus, I, man, when you talk about where two of us are gathered, two or three are gathered, that you're with us. And I love this line, when two of you get together on anything at all on earth and make a prayer of it, My Father in heaven goes into action. God, I just thank you that while we may not see it, you go into action. And so we're praying today for for so many things that matter so deeply to each of us. And, And God, would you just give us one person to reach out to and say, pray with me about this. Would you just put us in a situation where we can pray together? God, we just thank you that you go into action when we pray. And that when we pray in Jesus' name, it matters. And so would you shift things and move things? Would we see today that you are moving things um, and that prayer really matters? I believe it does. I know it does. And we are grateful, God, to get to partner with you in that. Jesus, we love you. We thank you for your word. We thank you that it is all true. It is all true. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.